Hey guys, I'm Coach Ty with Muscle Wiki. I've got the bicep breakdown for you today. So we're gonna give you the anatomy, the research, the fiber typing, proper amounts of rep sets, volume, and my favorite three exercises and several variations of each one. So here we go. The bicep is composed of two heads, hence the name bicep. And you've got a long head and a short head. The long head is on the lateral or the outside of the body. And the short head is on the medial side, which means middle or center. So lateral, outside, medial, middle, center. Moving on to our bicep functions. So first and foremost, elbow flexion. Simply flexing the elbow against resistance. So of course, any bicep curl will perform that function. Next, forearm supination. So when you hear supination, think sun, or turning your palm up toward the sun. When you hear pronation, think plants, turning your palm toward the floor. The bicep supinates the forearm or turns your palm up. And if you look at your own bicep, like I'm doing here, if you turn your palm upwards, you'll see your bicep flex on its own. We should also note the long head and the short head. The long head is primarily responsible for flexion and the short head primarily responsible for rotation. The bicep also aids the anterior deltoid in flexing the shoulder joint. Uh, its role in this function is relatively minuscule, so we can kind of skip past that function. We don't really need to do any shoulder flexion exercises. However, this is important to note for a concept called passive and active insufficiency. Passive insufficiency referencing when a muscle is too lengthened in order to properly exude force and active insufficiency meaning a muscle is too contracted to accurately or excuse me adequately exude force or produce force. That only happens to muscles that are biarticulate or that cross two joints. So because the bicep crosses both the elbow and the shoulder it's a biarticulate muscle and is therefore susceptible to passive and active insufficiency. Now this is why when you've got your shoulder flexed and you do a bicep curl like cable or you do like preacher curl because you got your elbow up, you get this really hard contraction in your bicep. And people tend to think that that means that that's going to train the bicep peak. Unfortunately, sorry, you can't train the bicep peak. I know that sucks, but it's the truth. Your bicep peak, your quote unquote bicep peak is totally dictated based on your genetics. If you have a shorter insertion point for your bicep, it's gonna appear a lot more high or like you have a peak. If you have a lower insertion, then it's gonna be a little bit flatter. So there are no exercises that will train your bicep peak specifically. It is debated how much the bicep actually contributes to elbow flexion. It's suspected, I should say, that the brachialis, the muscle that tucks underneath your bicep, is actually a stronger elbow flexor than the bicep's brachii. We do know the brachialis is the strongest flexor of the elbow in the absence of supination. So when you don't have your palms up on a curl, so again, you're doing a hammer curl or even a reverse curl, the brachialis is more so the muscle that's being trained. Now your biceps is still contributing, but the brachialis, the muscle that tucks underneath, is the stronger contributor. So if you wanna target your brachialis, go hammer or reverse curl. If you're trying to target your biceps, always palms up. Should you be training your brachialis? I would say yes. With all my program design, I try to cover all bases. And so I like to have one hammer curl, or reverse curl movement, brachialis category, and then one bicep movement, a movement with your palms up. Now I'm gonna show you a way, when we get to the exercise section, that you can do both with one exercise. Kill two birds with one stone. The bicep is one of the most fast twitch dominant muscles in the human body. And so it's very susceptible to muscle damage. So we have to be very conservative with the amount of volume that we're doing over the course of a week or a month or a training program, so on and so forth. So I always like to keep the biceps on the lower end of how much I'm doing, especially if you're doing movements like chin-ups. The chin-up puts the bicep through a very long range of motion and the EMG activity at the bicep 
the activation at the bicep is very high when doing a chin up. So if you're doing a lot of chin ups, you typically aren't gonna need a whole lot of extra bicep work. My recommendation for reps, sets, and frequency on the bicep is no more than twice per week. If you're doing a good amount of chin ups, then make that no more than one time per week for direct bicep work. Keep the reps on the lower end, so I'd say between four and 10, somewhere in there, and don't go over three sets in one session. You can even get away, this is gonna sound crazy, but you can even get away with just doing two sets for your biceps, and you will see growth. The biceps take a long time to recover from muscle damage, again, so we can make use of techniques that don't lead to very much muscle damage. So one such example is blood flow restriction or katsu training. Another such example would be doing bands on your bicep curls because they lead to less muscle damage because of the accommodating resistance. Also, I know this is blasphemous to the bodybuilding community, but doing partial range of motion leads to less muscle damage. So all these techniques might be useful for the biceps and maybe you should try one or two of these techniques within your bicep training and keep a a measure of your arms, like a circumference tape measure, to see what happens. So moving on to our exercise section. First, that exercise I mentioned a little bit earlier, where we can hit the brachialis and the biceps at the same time. This is a twisting curl. Now we have the weight offset in my hand, so we've loaded supination. So you have to twist against resistance. Also, we have elbow flexion, of course, and the first maybe third of the movement is a hammer curl. So we've got the brachialis, we've got the biceps brachii at the top, and we're also loading supination. And I also wanted to give you a single-sided view of it. Make sure you keep your upper arm glued in at your side, so we emphasize the stretch. I would rank this exercise number one for biceps because we cover so many bases. Number two, this is another variation of the Bayesian curl, one in which you lean forward. So you get the benefits of the stretch position in the back here, and then the benefit of a full contraction by leaning forward. So you're putting the biceps through an extremely long range of motion by performing this little waiter's bow kind of movement. Now you don't want to do this, and this is what I mentioned a minute ago or a second ago, letting your upper arm track behind you. In this position, we're gonna enter passive insufficiency, which we also talked about. And here, you see me bringing my elbow up forward and flexing my shoulder joint. So again, that's going to put the bicep into active insufficiency. It won't be able to properly exude force, so we wanna avoid that. Couple more variations of this Bayesian curl. The hammer curl. So if we wanna just target the brachialis, which again, I think is beneficial for a couple different reasons, we do that here. And we can also do a reverse curl. And again, we are putting the biceps through a very, or a brachialis, excuse me, through a very long range of motion by keeping those elbows to our side and having the resistance come from behind us instead of straight down like it does with a normal dumbbell or barbell curl. Moving on. So now we're once again emphasizing a stretch position. Now we are going into a little bit of passive insufficiency by really lengthening this bicep here and letting the arm track behind you somewhat. We don't want to have too low of an incline, keep it relatively high. And don't let your elbows track forward on this one either. Try to keep your arms back because in this exercise we are trying to stretch the bicep. And we've got a similar thing, a second variation, the hammer curl to hit your brachialis. And by the way, the brachialis tucking underneath your bicep. If the brachialis hypertrophies or grows, it will make your bicep appear larger. So again, that's why I try to cover all my bases and have at least one move for the brachialis and one for the biceps brachii. Moving on to a couple of banded exercises. Now this is for the purpose of minimizing muscle damage. So again, if you're already doing chin-ups or if you have another 
move that emphasizes the stretch and stretching a muscle under a load does quite a bit of muscle damage, then you might want your other move to be one in which we minimize muscle damage and doing elastic resistance, AKA accommodating resistance would be an option here. So that's two different variations I gave you for getting the band onto the bar. We can either do it this way by just laying the band over the bar and then standing on it, or you can do that little loop I did in the first clip. Always keep progressive overload in mind. Progressing on your weights and your overall volume is always desirable. And then last, I wanted to throw the chin up in here to show you just how long the range of motion really is at the elbow when performing a chin up and therefore just how much bicep will be involved. You get full extension of the bicep and then full flexion. So the chin up is a great bicep exercise. You might not get the biggest pump like you would with an isolation move, but regardless, I promise the chin ups will grow your biceps. And quick note, the pull up will not do as good of a job. You've got an overhand grip and therefore you'll be training the brachialis and the range of motion at the elbow is not as long. Oh, hi. That's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment and share. Also, I've got another bicep video there and over there. So make sure you check those out. And I'll see you with the next one. Deuces.